Today, I am so excited to bring you an episode with my previous client, Madison Meyer, who has gone from oh, the deep, dark depths of anorexia to, do you know what? Complete freedom. She's incredible. Welcome to Fly to Freedom, the anorexia recovery podcast. This podcast is for you if you're living in a restrictive eating disorder or supporting somebody else. I'm Julia Trahane, your host, an eating disorder recovery coach, and I lived in 40 years of anorexia, orthorexia, and exercise addiction before my recovery journey led me to complete freedom. Wherever you are in your recovery journey, this podcast is for you to help you grow and heal. Let's get on with the episode. Madison, I am so, so happy to have you on the podcast. Thank you. I'm excited. <laughs> you have done unbelievably well. You are a completely different woman to the woman I first started working with. Just everything about you, you have gone from almost like a frightened little girl into a confident, funny, I mean, you really are funny. You make me laugh. <laughs> so much happier woman who is in her own power and knows that she is fully worthy and meets her needs. It's incredible. Can you share a little bit about your life before recovery? What was your relationship with food, body, and exercise like? Um, <clears throat> that's kind of like a big question, but I'm going to do my best. So I, well, I wasn't diagnosed with an eating disorder until it was like two years ago. And, um, but I was already, you know, really sick but that's just like how the system usually works and also my family never even thought of it like it was like what an eating disorder like how and I guess people underestimate how common it really is I think they do yeah yeah and so I think I've had behaviors since I was younger but honestly I don't know um but before that, I was um, obsessively, like, very um, over-exercising, and I was cutting everything out of my diet, uh, sugar, uh, carbs, like, literally everything, and it was almost orthorexic-like, where I thought I was being healthy, but... Um, I I didn't know what I was doing. I started off, it, I think before that, I was pretty healthy. Um, but then I did track and I thought I had to do some like exercise stuff. And I ended up like really not liking track a lot. Um, it was, I'd run a lot. And then after it ended, I was like, I don't know what to do. I couldn't take a break. I ran through injuries, um, run when I was sick, and I was just really mean to myself, like super mean. <clears throat> I never do that to myself now. Um, but I just thought that's like what everybody else did. Like I was like, just everybody else does that. And no, not really. And um one comment that really got to me, I was doing track, and when you're expending that much energy, you get really, really hungry, and I still had a pretty okay relationship with food, so I, like, after track meets, like, I would eat a bunch of food, because I was just like, I am so hungry, but one time, I don't know where I was at, I think it was a family event, um, and maybe it was like Easter or something. And I, um, I had a lot for like, why? Like, cause I was really hungry. I had done a lot of exercise and uh, I think it was a family member said to me, oh, you've 
that's a lot of food. And I was like, am I not supposed to eat this much? Like, and so that's the point where I started, oh, maybe I should like not eat this much. And the food limit literally went down until I did not eat anything but one thing. Like my mom would make meals and, um, and I was 17 at the time and she'd make meals and I would cry and I would not eat them. And she wanted me to eat so bad. And the only thing I'd eat was like peanut butter toast. So that was my relationship with food then. It was just like really restricted, like nothing. I would eat nothing. And that is not good for you. Oh, and now we have an appearance. <laughs> no, it's not good for you at all, is it? Hello, Callie. That's Callie's <laughs> hat for people that aren't on the video. Episode. Yeah. Um, so things got so bad, you ended up in hospital, didn't you, in inpatient treatment? I did. Um, I had a pediatrician at the time, and he actually knew quite a bit of eating disorders versus some of the other ones. He was one of my best doctors. I love him very much. Um, and he got me into a partial patient first, and I did have to travel quite a ways. It was about an hour and a half. We only have, in Iowa, this is where I, I live in Iowa, and um, we only have one eating disorder clinic in Iowa. And a couple, no, it was a year later, they had closed the adult unit, but I was like the inpatient adult unit. And I, I was an adolescent at the time. So I was in the adolescent unit, but um, I can't remember how many beds they had in the adolescent, but I know it was probably like that. Uh, the adult unit had about the same as the adolescent unit. Um, the adolescent had four beds, but the inpatient or the partial patient, which is what I did before that, they could take like, I don't know, it was less than 10. It was like eight people. Mm -hmm. So I got in pretty quick to that. I got in um, I don't know, maybe a month later. Um, and I was there for a week and a half and um I started eating I was like oh yeah this is like this is where I can eat but then they started giving me more food like in days amount like just just like so much in a, in a day and that overwhelmed me a lot and so I got worse again so um they they were like okay we really need to get you to the inpatient. And they asked me if I really wanted to do that. I was like, yeah, I really want to get better. And I didn't really know what I was signing up for. And um, so I think not too many days later, which is a miracle. There was some um, person in the uh, partial patient that recommended me to go to the inpatient. Um, and I got in really quick. It was like the next bed that person was leaving. And there's only four beds and it was in a psych ward as well. So there was um, 12 beds and then only four of them were eating disorders. Um, and so I got in and it was like the worst thing I'd ever gone through in my entire life. Like, I swear. <laughs> I cried so much and my mom did like you know having to leave me there and I stayed in there for three months and I lived there like you couldn't really do anything when you first got there you couldn't even walk they put you in a wheelchair <clears throat> and you had to be wheelchaired around and um I didn't like this about it but they'd have levels so depending on what level you were, you get to walk or not, or how much you get to walk. Um, they even have how much you would eat in that certain level. And I don't like that because eating disorder, like recovery does not have levels. No, does it doesn't. It? Um, <laughs> but they did save my life, really. I was extremely underweight. 
um, like I could have died. Um, I was so close that I could have been put in the hospital and like fit, fed by a tube, but mm -hmm. I didn't. I was very lucky and I didn't get refeeding syndrome at all, which is also very lucky. Um, and, um, it was really hard because I just wanted to, I, they, they didn't change the mindset. They would just feed you. You'd eat, yeah. but they didn't change your mindset. The therapy was great, but they just didn't change the mindset. And um, they let me out earlier than I should have, for sure. And I got out the day I was a senior in high school when I um, went into all this inpatient stuff. And um, I luckily graduated or well, I, I didn't walk across the stage yet, but I graduated like I finished all of my courses before I went into the hospital so I could focus on my treatment when I was there which was really nice otherwise they did have like schooling stuff there mm -hmm. but I got out the um the day before my graduation and I did get to walk down the stage which was really great yeah I did get to walk across the stage and it was great um my friends were so happy to see me and but I was also happy to get out of high school yeah. but I have that wasn't the end really that was only the beginning of my recovery I don't know if you want me to keep going but I guess. yeah please do so what okay. happened after you came out because I hadn't met you at this point and yep. when I met you you were a very sick girl indeed yes um I then, let's see, I had the summer. Things went downhill after the summer. Then I decided I wanted to go to this college. Um, I'm so glad I didn't go to this college. I'm actually going to a different college now. I'm here right now. I am so glad. I thought I wanted to be a nurse. I'm so glad I didn't do that. <laughs> um, but... Um, yeah, I tried to go to the college. I was there for their welcome week and I was in a room with other girls and I was like, nope, I can't do this. I was like, this is, no. I would I would have went extremely downhill if I would have stayed there. So I paused my enrollment and I moved out like right before classes started. And I um, called the... Well, actually, before I left, oh, here's the other cat. Yes, you're in the way. Thank you. Um, I had moved back out of college, and the I went back to the partial patient, which is what I started with. I let's see, did I even finish their program? I don't know. I don't remember that one. I just don't remember. My memory is not great for when I was sick either. Well, that's not surprising, is it? Your brain wasn't working properly when you were sick. I think I did finish it. And then I waited till the spring semester. And I was going to go back to that school in the spring. I moved in the first day. The exact same day I moved back out. My mom was pretty angry. But I was like, I don't like it here. They moved me into a dorm. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. I'm so sorry. <laughs> the life with cats, right? Oh. Cat attack on the screen there. Yep, they're gonna probably attack them, but we'll see. We'll hope. Okay. Um, I will go into a private place, but my apartment is all one room. So I went back to spring. I moved out the same day I moved in. The dorms were terrible. They were dirty. There was mold. It smelled terrible. It smelled like pot. I just, yeah, it was bad. So I moved back out and I was like, I'm not going to this school. It's terrible. And it's a private school too. You expect, you expect a lot more out of a private school. Mm -hmm. um, I went back into, um, let's see. Yeah, I went back into partial patient again. But I don't think it was until a little bit later this time. Um, 
Yeah, and I don't really remember what happened after that. I know that I didn't go to school. I took a whole year off. Um, and I worked a lot. I did a lot of different jobs. And that really helped my social life, you know? Um, and I quit early that, that time. I think I had suicidal thoughts. And I did go into the ER the one time. <clears throat> And I was extremely depressed because I thought that I'd never recover from the eating disorder. And I was like very depressed. And so then <clears throat> it was that summer. Uh, and I think not soon after, I think I finally, I think I went back in a fourth time. I'm not even kidding you. And I went through the whole program and I was like, yeah, I am so much better now. No, I wasn't. <laughs> even though I made it through their whole program they actually cut their program down they'd actually let the people stay there until they actually deemed that they were ready but now they cut it down especially um um because I'm in America so we have insurance and insurance kind of deems when you're ready which is terrible okay. insurance deems when people are healed from an eating disorder which is they, they don't know they don't it's know. not okay no they don't know um, and then that is later, that's when I met you right before I went to school. It was that summer. Mm -hmm. um, and that is when I met you. I was probably, I wasn't your, I don't know if I was your hardest client, but I was very difficult. I just know it. I know I was, I was very <laughs> difficult and I, I made it through my first semester here. I go to university of Northern Iowa and I made it through my first semester here. I'm now a sophomore. And that second semester, I did online, and that was the best decision I could have ever made. I got a lot worse at school that first semester because I lived in an apartment alone, and I didn't, I barely ate anything. I don't know how I functioned. Somehow I made it on the dean's list. I don't know. It's amazing what you can do when you are sick like that. But I wasn't living. I wasn't really living. Yes. Yeah, I got on the dean's list and yeah, I did all this stuff, but you I wasn't were, living. You were so anxious. You yeah. were compulsive. You were running in between classes. You were running as much as you possibly could. Yeah. Barely eating anything. And you were just constantly pushing yourself I've got to do more work I've got to do more reading I've got to do more this and I need to be successful if I don't do this I won't be successful and you were just telling yourself all the time you weren't good enough yeah um I then that semester that is when the magic happened um it was slow at first but then it went really fast and it was really hard, like extremely hard. I just like sat down. <laughs> I sat down. And what helped though was I actually, I did online school. So I had a lot of work to do. So I sat on my computer all day long, which is like, what, what is like, what is the best distraction other than that? I can't tell you. Uh, it was hard to think, though, sometimes, because all of the eating disorder thoughts are there. But, yeah, it was it was a good distraction. The summer was hard, but I started doing more things that I enjoy that are were gentle to my body. I went fishing, and I love fishing. Like, um, just, I love nature. Um, I spend a lot of time in nature. Um, and I just found the things that I enjoy. I enjoy my faith. Um, and I think having a faith is really important or just a spiritual, um, just connecting with your spiritualness is very important in your recovery um, and in life in general. I think it adds this. It doesn't matter what spiritual you choose. It could be anything, but it just adds to your life, in my opinion. Um, it just, it's something outside of yourself that kind of just, I don't know, it brings you back to yourself. I don't know if you get what I'm saying. 
I just, do. It, it shows yeah. you part of a bigger picture. Yeah. So and just, that, sorry, and I was just going to say, and that really helps with my recovery, was just having a spiritual life. Can you describe in, let's say, three words, how you felt before you recovered? Before? Scared, hopeless, and those two really sum it up, but I'm trying to think of a third one. Just in despair, really. Can you give us three words of how you feel now? Yeah, okay. It's going to be hard because I have many words. Um, <laughs> very happy. I know that's two words, but we're just going to make it one. Put a okay. dash. You can have both, yep. <laughs> um, While you're thinking, actually, you would never have done that. You would never have wanted to put a dash in and make two words one because you had to do everything right. Oh, and, perfectly. <laughs> and now you're like no let's just make it one word I love that that's amazing yeah um, so yeah I'm very happy um open-minded nice. I can just I can see the world clearly I was walking from my classes I do that now and a lot of kids have their headphones in and they're just kind of in their own world. I'm like, come on, guys, let's let's look around. You know, it's so beautiful here on campus, and it's like that's okay. But I can just see the world now. Like I can think of how I was before. I didn't even think about those things. I didn't think about the world around me. I'm like, wow, look at the squirrel. Uh, I like to hang out with the squirrels a lot here on campus. They're kind of tame, but not really. But I've had some close encounters. <laughs> um, and then another word is abundant. That's I think that's the word, oh, abundant. Yes. Yeah. I love that. Absolutely love that. So how did it feel once you began to see the changes physically, mentally, and emotionally in your recovery process? I'm not going to lie. It was really hard to see those physical changes. Yeah, I guess. Uh, just like, you know, your clothes not fitting you anymore. That was the worst. Oh my gosh. I was freaking out because I do not, I don't, I am still like this. Uh, <laughs> I don't really like to spend money <laughs> because I don't really have a lot of money uh, because I'm a college student. And, uh, uh, but I didn't like to spend money. I didn't like people to spend money on me and I still don't. But I, I think it's just part of my giving I'm a very giving person but I've began to give to myself too I'm not just like giving everything like I did before um but it was hard and to see like stretch marks or mm -hmm. bloated or oh what else I don't even know I can't even think of it all there there was a lot but I loved hearing people say you look alive your skin tell you your skin looks great I'm like yeah thanks uh I like it when people say your skin looks great or it's like my gray. yeah it was like gray and my hair is super healthy uh nails are in between I just work a lot with my hands uh I have I a, a I, time. yeah I everything else like my toenails are healthy it's just because I don't use my toenails like I use my hands a lot and it's also getting to the cold season so yeah lots of lotion how do you feel mm -hmm. about your body now you told us how hard it was seeing it change and I feel yeah. that. how do you feel now I sometimes I feel really great I don't like Dang, look at the meat on them bones. And I work at That's the library. Like that. <laughs> yeah, I always talk about that. <clears throat> like, I have some older friends. My degree is gerontology, so I will be working with the elderly. Um, and most of my friends are the elderly back at home. I miss them very much. That's the hardest part about being on campus is just missing my older friends. Because now you're surrounded by kids 
that are just and I say kids we're supposed to be adults no we're kids okay I don't care what you say <laughs> um everybody's a kid at heart especially me Madison your body how do you feel about your body? <laughs> <laughs> um, I feel great I the meat on my bones uh I feel really strong because before I was like you know, I was weak, you know, I couldn't really do anything. And now I'm like, I feel like my body's really strong. Um, Can I share something that you said about your bum on our last call with the new trousers? <laughs> sure. <laughs> and I love these new trousers or pants, you call them, don't you? I love these new pants because damn, my ass looks cute in them. Some of the I pants love. I have just make my butt look weird. And I, I love like... that. I love that you're <laughs> celebrating your body. It was fantastic. And you would never have done that. No. <laughs> so Madison, how did working with me as your recovery coach make a difference in your journey? It did a lot. Um, it, um, I almost, sometimes it was like hard love but it was really good um i wasn't acting my age and um you helped me step up and make my own decisions um and just notice those things that i couldn't see excuse me um yeah just that and you were you held me accountable and I needed that accountability. I think everybody in their recovery journey needs accountability. It is very, very important to have somebody to hold you accountable. Mm -hmm. What about the aspect of bringing in self-compassion and self-love? You helped me do that a lot because I didn't do any of that before. Self-love, self-who, I didn't know. Um, I I still have it. You've recorded two meditations for me. I still have them on my phone. I haven't listened to them for a while. I haven't needed them. I still meditate, but those were the start of my, I, I think they were anyway. They were the start of my self-compassion journey. It was just listening to those meditations. You even made me make one for my, like, um, with my own voice. Yes, I did. So I, I have that one too. Um, I've done so many activities on our calls and each one of them, I sometimes didn't see the purpose at the point, at that point, but later on, I really noticed that. I really, I, I could see the point and they made a big difference. And um Sometimes I don't really know how the self-compassion happened. It was almost like magic. It just kind of started to appear once I started, once I was in my right mind um, because the eating disorder voice got quieter throughout my recovery. I could start like just, it's not really finding, and you know, no, it is. It's finding your own voice. Yes, it is. That's a beautiful way of putting it. Yeah, because your own voice was just really quiet before. Um, and it's just um, letting it become louder. Were there any specific tools or strategies or insights from our sessions that really helped you through some of those tough moments? Uh, <laughs> this one's funny. I don't know why I thought of this one, but the placemat. You made me make a placemat. Yes. Sorry, he's making a weird noise. <laughs> um, but the placemat, that was great. I love that. I did get rid of it, though, only because it was really dirty. Yeah, no, I get that. <laughs> so just for the listeners, Madison made herself a placemat of all encouraging quotes and self-love and mantras and things to help encourage you when you were actually eating, didn't you? Yes, I actually have some placemats now <laughs> uh but they're like real placemats um 
this isn't one. I have one in front of me, but this one is one I have for those who are watching the video. I have this one. It's oh. very fall. It's just really pretty. So I eat on top of that. But it's it just nice to have a place, Matt. I don't know. But it, it really helped healthy. you. You found it really helpful to have all that motivation that you'd given yourself while you were eating. Yeah, I would. There was always the specific ones that were around. I, I think I purposely did this. The ones that I could see, like the plate was kind of covering a couple of them. Mm -hmm. But the ones I could see were those ones that I'd really focus on. I just want to take a moment to share something I think will make your day just a little bit brighter. If you're someone who's looking for a simple way to infuse your mornings with a little more positivity and love, I've got something special for you. I'm thrilled to introduce my daily love emails, a little dose of encouragement and inspiration delivered right to your inbox every single morning. They're designed to set the tone for your day with mantras, affirmations and gentle reminders to help you start your day with intention and love. Whether you're feeling overwhelmed, stuck, or just need a little pick-me-up, these emails will give you the gentle nudge you need to move forward with clarity and purpose. And as a bonus, every week you'll get an exclusive sneak peek of my upcoming podcast episode, plus extra resources to help you on your journey. So if you're ready to start each day on a positive note, head to the link in the show notes and sign up for my daily love emails. It's completely free, and I can't wait to be a part of your morning routine. Click the link, sign up, and let's make every day a little bit brighter together. So how did the really personalized approach that we did together support your needs in a different way from the more one-size-fits-all you had in previous treatments? It was very tailored to me because um I feel like you met me where I was at and there were no rules to follow it was just uh, I mean yes there were rules to follow but there, wasn't <laughs> there were three meals and three snacks that was for sure <laughs> yeah and like no movement at all um but I'm trying to think of like what I mean by no rules it's just like there weren't any levels like I was talking about before. Yeah. I didn't have levels. Like when I was ready, I would just, I'd go again, you know, I would just go up on my, just in my journey, I would just move along it. Like it was water, you know, I, I, I use that quote a lot, you know, like, you know, life is like water it just kind of flows. Sometimes it, it'll ebb and flow. Um, and this is a really hard question, really. Um, I could be in my own environment. I didn't have to be in a hospital with a bunch of people I didn't know. Yeah. Um, I know there's family-based treatment and I did that sometimes, um, because I was younger, my mom would make some meals. She didn't make all of them. We started out where she made a lot of them. And I'd like to eat with somebody too. And it was nice to eat with somebody, but um, I don't know, I just... One of the big differences is owning your recovery and your choices yeah. and your actions, isn't it? Yeah, because um, you didn't tell me what to eat. The places that the hospital would give you food pretty much, like, and you had to eat it. I could still kind of, um, some of the times I could make my own food, like you're actually making food like you would in real life, you know, like the hospital isn't really suited for real life. It is outside of life. And here I could be in real life. I wasn't um, missing out. I was just right there. And you were taking responsibility for your healing rather than somebody dictating to you what to do. Yes. And that was a hard concept for me to get because I had been in so many treatments. Yeah. But you did get it. And yes. 
I am so proud of you because you literally are such a different woman. You're in, you're just so different. You're so much happier. You glow. You have the most beautiful smile, which is almost always there now, whereas <laughs> was never there to begin with. Yeah. Um, your relationship with your mum is so much better. Yeah, that was a hard part. <laughs> <laughs> in fact your relationships in general are so much better aren't they you yeah they are you were so isolated before yeah I forgot about that yeah I really was yeah you felt very alone very isolated um so for somebody who's on the fence about whether to get support or whether to start recovering recovery how would you encourage them to take that first step hmm. um I say coaches is the best option really I've done it all I forgot to mention I also did online eating disorder treatment and that wasn't very good either I finally got rid of them <laughs> just, just the coaching is the best option yes it is it is the best option because um, you're real with me. These people kind of act fake. I'm not going to lie. Very professional. Um, and you've been through it. And that really helps me because it's like, you can see from my perspective. Mm -hmm. And you feel understood then. Yes, I feel understood. And um, I guess the biggest thing is... Um, money is really hard it's really hard to get that money but um I promise you um even if you are kind of struggling with that I'd still say try to attempt it because you will not regret the money that you spent but you also have to make sure not that you're ready but that you are willing to show up for yourself. Yes. And investment is part of that, isn't it? Because you're yes. investing in yourself and in your future and in your freedom. Yes. And that can be really hard to say that you're going to spend money on that. Because I think when you're in that mindset, you don't want to give up anything for yourself. Yeah. You don't feel like you deserve it to begin with, do you? No. But you do. That's Everybody so does. Everybody deserves to be happy because, and healthy because that's how we were made to be, you know. Honestly, it's been, it's so amazing to have you here and sharing your story. So if you can share one message with listeners about hope and recovery, what would it be? I also want to say if I can do it, you can do it <laughs> because... <laughs> I say we're we're all human, we're all equal. And if somebody can do something, then you can do it too. Like nothing is impossible. And um once you start, um you just gotta push to the end, you know, just push it out and uh it's kinda like um I love the analogy of a butterfly. Okay. Like, yes. When you, it's like, you know, you got to suffer nice. through the cocoon process and then you got to eat the cocoon. I think that's what they do. That's kind of gross. Um, but then you become a beautiful butterfly like your background. So. <laughs> you do. You absolutely do. So. Would you say 100% that recovery is worth the journey? Yes, you learn so much too. It helps you become part of who you are in a way. You know, some people think, why me? Why me? Why am I sick? Or why do I have eating disorder? And it's like, think of it as you are meant to show an example to the world that anything is possible. And it teaches you so much about yourself and you'll realize that 
yes, it was terrible to say, like, nobody deserves to go through this. But at the same time, it helps you become a new person, helps you become stronger. And you learn so many valuable lessons throughout the process that I sometimes, like, you know, other people might take for granted. So, yeah. I love the fact that you said you learned so much about yourself because it's not really just all about the food, is it? It's about no. bringing in that self-compassion, bringing in that self-love and stepping into your own beautiful power. Yes. And making the world happen for you, not to you. Mm -hmm. Yes. Because the world isn't really happening to you. Like you... You're not at the center of it, you know what I mean? Like that's that's not what it is. It's everybody's around you, everybody's going through the same thing. I love common humanity. That was one thing that got me through things. Um, because there is not one person that isn't going this through the same thing as you. And you can it's hard to find the power, but you can you can find the power and the will to recover. Absolutely. Well, Madison, we probably should wrap it up there, although we could talk for so long. Yeah, <laughs> it goes on really fast. It's been so fantastic having you as a guest. And I am celebrating you so much. You are. Oh, you're amazing. You're so strong. You're so incredible. And you're living your life fully now and I love that and I'm so proud of you and I love you I love you too so much and I thank you just for everything you've done and I just wish I could just like give everything to you for that you know <laughs> your recovery and seeing your transformation is everything this is why I do this job because how different I felt when I recovered and I just was like I just want everybody else to feel this I don't want anybody else to stay stuck I and feel the exact same way isn't it it's just you just almost want to shout it from the rooftops like life is so much better you've got to recover it's amazing yeah and so many people just even if they don't have an eating disorder they live in disordered eating lives and I'm like come on just eat whatever you want it's fine oh, God, he knows <laughs> what to do <laughs> right sweetheart thank you so so much for being an incredible client and an incredible guest and thank you listeners so much for tuning in again and celebrating Madison's journey with us see you next week Bye.